atheism and agnosticism where many of them, most of them, attributed their entrance into the church and their vocation to the visit of John Paul II to Cuba, which was certainly a, a watershed event in the history of that country. The day that I arrived at the seminary, they discovered that there was one seminarian who had been an infiltrator put there by the government to spy on the seminary. And the rector said to me, Oh, Bishop, we were so surprised. This young man was so pious and was so diligent and, and friendly and punctual. I said, That should have been a day given. <laughs> We have all seen the very dramatic uh, situation of the church and religious freedom since the Cuban Revolution. And the political and religious liberty are still very restricted in Cuba. The church's ability to carry on her mission is greatly compromised. So, yet many courageous men and women are striving to keep the church alive and vital, even under these very challenging circumstances. Uh, we are very blessed to have panelists with us today who are very well equipped to uh, shed light on the Cuban situation for us. Uh, our two panelists are Archbishop uh, Thomas Wensky of Miami and Thomas uh, Garofalo. Our panelists will each take about 10 or 15 minutes for their presentation. That will be followed by an opportunity for questions and dialogue. Uh, we will have a reporter or someone taking notes and is going to distill all kinds of wisdom out of these discussions. And, uh, and our reporter is Dr. Sandra Barueco, who is from South Cuban, a fellow of the Institute for Policy and Research and Economic Studies, and assistant professor here at the Catholic University of America. Uh, Sandra, thank you very much for taking on this uh, challenge. And you will then, at the full assembly, present the insights that emerge from this session, particularly on three points. One, what is the current situation of religious freedom in Cuba? What would work best in Cuba to improve religious freedom? And what can the church and faith-based organizations do to defend and advance religious freedom in Cuba? And what can the Congress or the administration or government in the United States do? And with uh, the introductions to our speakers have already been made, so I would just invite uh, Archbishop Tom Lansky to, to begin. Thank you, Gareth. A few years ago, when I was in Cuba speaking to Archbishop Elise of Santiago, I will have a memory. He was talking that in the early 80s, he was visited by a uh, theologian from. Czech Republic, and after spending some time in Cuba, he offered this evaluation of, of the Church of Cuba. He offered this evaluation of uh, the difference church in Cuba and a place like Poland, he said that in Cuba, the state persecutes the church, whereas in Poland, the church persecutes the state. <laughs> that, of course, was many, many years ago. What we can say about the current situation is that it's much better than what it has been, but it's not what it should be. I think a little historical background is important. First of all, even before Castro, uh, Cuba was a country that had a very strong secularist, or very strong secularist factions. The church was present in Cuba, but uh, it had not penetrated all levels of Cuban society or all areas of Cuba. There were lots of people that uh, perhaps might have been baptized, but never were adequately canonized because the church, even before Castro, lacked sufficient numbers of pastoral agents to, to be uh, an effective presence in all areas of Cuba. And in the early stages of the Cuban Revolution, the revolution itself was not overtly anti-religious or anti-Catholic. 
National Insurgent Army had Catholic chaplains accompany uh, his soldiers. Uh, after the triumph of the revolution, uh, Castro enjoyed broad support from the human population, including from members of the church and from some members of the hierarchy. A lay leader of Catholic action who had been sympathetic to the movement that set uh, that resulted in the Cuban Revolution was named by Castro as his first ambassador to Spain. Later he was recalled from Spain and imprisoned for several years, but uh, nevertheless in those early days uh, it did not, was not apparent to all that there was any hostility to religion or to the church coming from the revolution. That changed in the uh, within a year or two after uh, Castro took power. Uh, it changed as he revealed his Marxist direction. Tensions grew and uh, they were exasperated by the state taking over Catholic schools and other institutions. During the 1961, around the uh, Bay of Pigs invasion, uh, there was a breaking point that was reached. Uh, the church was increasingly accused by revolutionary forces as being responsible or sympathetic or in cahoots with counter revolutionaries. Uh, such an interpretation was given to a rather large rally of Catholics in Havana at that time that gathered about a million Catholics together. Uh, and so when the Bay of Pigs came about, those people had Catholic chaplains with them when they invaded Cuba. Uh, at that same time, uh, because of the fears of parents that their children would be even sent away outside of Cuba to be indoctrinated into uh, Marxism and communism, uh, parents started to send their children to the United States to Miami in the famous Pedro Pan program which brought over 14,000 youngsters to the United States. They were cared for primarily through the agency of the Catholic Church here in this country. Uh, so in that context of, you know, Catholics, uh, especially more practicing Catholics, sending their children out of the country and then themselves leaving the country, context of the uh, Communists labeling the Catholics as being counter revolutionaries and subversives to the revolution uh, caused a very, very violent attitude towards the church from, from the uh, government and the revolutionary, the revolution supporters. This uh, was really, uh, you know, something that was. Very, 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 very difficult because people were harassed, assaulted. Uh, when they were leaving their countries, they were humiliated. Leaving the country to come to the United States, they were humiliated. Uh, if they tried to practice their faith, they were discriminated against. Children were harassed or laughed at in the classrooms that they were about uh, to be practicing Catholics, etc. So there was a very high uh, line of suspicion, uh, recrimination, uh, prejudice, and discrimination between uh, those that supported the revolution and those that remained faithful to the church. Now, Castro, at that time, also tried some things that were tried in other communist countries. For example, he tried to set up a national church. Independent of Rome. He failed, but he tried that. Uh, he, uh, he did succeed in doing something like that to the Protestants, set up a Protestant uh, association that uh, was controlled by the government. But the Catholic Church remained independent and uh, free of that government control. But very, very distinct. Archbishop of Havana died in the early 60s. He was very 
without any public ceremonies, but just one or two people attending to the grandson uh, because no public expression of the faith was allowed anymore. Now when the churches remained open, So you could say that, like other countries, there was freedom of worship, but not freedom of religion, which is an important distinction that we have to remember, even when we think about our own domestic challenges here. The Castro strategy also, unlike what happened in other countries in an earlier instance of uh, communist persecution, Castro strategy was not to make martyrs, but to make apostates. Castro bragged that he never shot a priest. It was kind of a clericalist idea at the church because he did shoot some uh, Catholic lady and imprisoned many others. But the strategy to make apostates, not martyrs, was one that pretty much succeeded in the sense that People knew that if they went to church, they would not get promotions, they would lose their jobs, their kids would not get into universities, etc., etc. And so many people that did not have you know, a real strong, well-developed, uh, catechized kind of faith uh, decided to go along, to get along. And, and so they uh, either uh, gave up the practice of faith or kept it uh, hidden. Church for many, many years, hunger now to survive, to say what could be saved. And that was what it was doing when in the mid 80s, I think, inspired and encouraged by John Paul II, the church in Cuba had a uh, national meeting that they called in that Metro Nacional case in Guada, in which it was sort of like a national synod, and a reflection in which the church said we will engage with the society and not just stay hidden in our in our sacristy, so to speak. And it was it was well timed because a few years later the Soviet Union fell, and and the communists started started to make some changes. They changed their constitution. No longer did they define themselves as a confessional state with atheism being the state religion. They defined themselves, redefined themselves as a lay state. Uh, in 1991, they allowed Caritas, the Catholic Charities of Cuba, to be reconstituted. Something that was a great uh, difficulty for uh, people of the, of, of, of the government, since, you know, communist government is the ultimate uh, big bad state, and for them to accept that there could be another actor delivering uh, services and needs of people was a bitter pill for many of them to swallow and to, to accept it. But in these years since then, they have grown, grown much more acceptance. What was a watershed, as Cardinal O'Malley said, was the visit of John Paul II in 1998. And that visit almost gave a signal to the Cuban population that it was safe once again to be a believer. And following the Pope's visit there, we had many people coming back to church. And, uh, and again, these, uh, the church continued to expand the space of the game through country tops and other areas. Since the post visit, we have the seminary being built, first building built by the church in 52 years, uh, built with the cooperation of the state because they own all the means of, you know, if you can't go to Home Depot, you just buy them to get the state. But it was also the state cooperating in, in a way of, you know, of giving 
compensation for the fact that they had taken over the seminary and confiscated it some uh, uh, two to three decades ago. So it was, uh, it was, and you have other instances of, you know, parish church being returned to the church, buildings being returned to church, and efforts to do to be honored. So it's almost like the, the state or the human uh, government trying to dig, dig themselves out of a hole that they dug themselves into in the early 60s when they reacted very violently against uh, religion, against the church. They're, makes, they're making some progress, but it's far from what is needed to be uh, to say that the church is enjoying freedom. Um, before the uh, Cuban Revolution, there were about a thousand priests working in Cuba. Right now, there's about 200. And it seems that the government likes to keep it at that number so that uh, when bishops are trying to recruit new priests to come in, uh, if somebody leaves, goes back home, a visa will be forthcoming. But the government is still very uh, reluctant to let the number of priests go more than 200. It's the ceiling there. Uh, the, uh, the church still doesn't have full access to media, although, for example, uh, the Pope's masses were televised. The bishops of Cuba were allowed to speak on the radio to talk about our radio charity, etc. So it's, it's a very uh, interesting dance right now. And it's a dance in which uh, the church tries to gain space to assert itself in an area that perhaps it hasn't been allowed into before. And then once they're trying not to do that, and at the same time, the, the state being very tentative about whether we can let them get away with this much and whether we should or not. Uh, that, that, I think, uh, you know, Tom Burnham will tell you about some of that dance that he did with uh, the Catholic Relief Services. But uh, one of the questions there is, what can we do? What can we do then? Or church. The moves that the government has made have been very honest and not daring enough. We should support the church in their efforts to, their efforts to gain that more space. I think we also have to try to do no harm as we extend our support to the church and to other people of religious faith in Cuba. Recently, when the Archbishop of Havana visited the Archbishop of Boston, there was a controversy over some things that the Archbishop had said in Boston that created great uh, angst in Miami. And uh, it was a you know usual fight between uh, brothers, if you will. And our government did not help it because an agency of our State Department, they like Radio RT, allowed to be published on their website and their radio programs, a attack on the cardinal, called him a lackey of the government, which certainly serves no, way, no purpose except the government of Cuba's purpose. And, uh, and it was an interesting example of, uh, again, the lack of res respect for religious freedom. Uh, this country, and one that was playing off in a very negative way in this other country, and their efforts to move forward to greater religious freedom. So we can 
support religious freedom in Cuba with virtually no harm. Secondly, by supporting the church and, and their efforts and, and being careful not to uh, bring the experience of the church in Cuba through lenses that don't make sense to Cuba. Cuban bishops and Cuban priests have told me many, many times of how they, you know, got frustrated when somebody comes to Cuba and tries to interpret this whole experience of the church and the state there to the eyes of, you know, theology of liberation. Because, and that may come out, you know, on the short end of the street saying, uh, as people were telling them, they're suffering for their sin because they did not take the side of the poor, which was not never, which was never the case. So uh, I think uh, as Cuba moves towards a transition, we should be on the side of the church there. We should be on the side of reconciliation, uh, supporting the church's efforts to reconcile the human people among themselves. And that way, we will support the church, which right now is the strongest element of civil society in Cuba, to expand its presence in space, but in doing so, to create space for other actors in civil society. With that. Thank you very much, Archbishop. And now, uh, Tom. Our follow who has so much experience to do with his CRS association will now give us his reflections. Thank you much, Aaron. Uh, this works. Uh, uh, as, as, as the Archbishop has, has made clear, Cuba is really relative to some of the uh, context that uh, Cardinal Dolan spoke about in his initial remarks, is a uh, relatively bright spot. And Right spot, not least because of the emphasis of, of uh, the garden and the Archbishop here at the podium and, and, and being some of the people that were uh, that are in this in this room, and and most of all because of the work of, of uh, very committed and self-sacrificing Catholics in, in Cuba, um, who it was a great pleasure to work with closely when I worked with uh, Catholic Relief Services um, a few years ago, um, and I, I like the title of this. Conference, uh, and this is on the common good because it really, for me, is a very apt uh, aspect of what the Catholic Church has been able to accomplish in Cuba. They, um, and kind of the summary of my remarks following on, on uh, Archbishop Wednesday's is that the church has been very successful at uh, pushing its way into spaces that uh, had been previously uh, exclusion, exclusionary uh, through their persistence. Um, and this is really accelerating. I think we've seen some of the political developments uh, in recent years. This is really the, the, the visible part of the iceberg of what is happening with the Catholic Church in Cuba, where you have at the very grassroots level amazing progress in terms of just introducing these concepts that are so uh, central to Catholic social doctrine uh, to the wider population of Cuba. And it was just amazing for me to, to, be, to be a part of that. Um, so my perspective comes from my years working with Catholic Relief Services in, in Cuba, and, and our operation was uh, exceedingly humble. It was really it was just uh, uh, one person acting as sort of a conduit and, and trying to coordinate with, with the very active diocese in the United States, including Boston and, and Miami, above, above others, uh, to try and support the work of Caritas Cuba. But for me, it provided, through many visits, I was not allowed to live there, but I was able to make almost unlimited visits to, to the island. Uh, a real window into the motivations of the people that, that made their work live and um, their struggle. And the struggle can't be really uh, over and uh, emphasized. As the Archbishop said, people really did have their lives changed dramatically for the worse because they continued to practice their faith. And that, I think, doesn't happen anywhere near to the extent that it used to. But I know we all know many people who uh, were demoted from their jobs and fired and, and uh, excluded from society because of that. 
But the, the strategy was focused on, 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 on I'd say, three, three concepts, transparency, engagement, and above all, persistence. And as both the Cardinal and the Archbishop pointed out, they didn't really have much of a choice in terms of the transparency aspect. Uh, the, the story that I always remember is uh, all the Cuban, many of the Cuban bishops are quite Many of the Cuban bishops are quite unequal, but, but I think it's the way I'm holding it, too. You had to press me against your chin, I saw it. I'm not trying to. Um, <laughs> our Archbishop uh, Adolfo Rodriguez, who many of you will no doubt remember, he used to tell us, you know, he was very mindful of what we would meet together. And uh, he told wonderful stories about his conversations with Fidel. And, uh, and uh, you know, we would, I would smoke a cigar, he would smoke his cigarettes. Uh, we might have a little rum, and we would talk about these amazing conversations. And uh, it wasn't until after the Archbishop passed away that uh, they discovered the big bug that was in his office. So that we we had to share our conversations uh, with with the state, and so that sort of reinforced the whole idea that transparency was was a regular uh, aspect of their of their work. But the government pursued this consistent strategy as well. The government was trying to keep the, the, the church inside the church to work on liturgy. If they did allow them outside, they would uh, demand that we, that the church would work with non-political populations, the elderly, uh, chronically ill, uh, children with Down syndrome. Uh, but the pattern, was, the pattern was clear, that the church would continue to, to persist in trying to open up new space what he said about the transformation that the church lived through in the early 80s. Um, uh, but Caritas was really the laboratory of their work. It was, it was, uh, it was where they, they kind of perfected these strategies uh, to accompany the people, to analyze their situation, to recognize the role that the church would play to ameliorate suffering, to convince the government to allow Caritas to fit that role. I will repeat what the Archbishop said about um, the the, uh, the implosion of the Soviet uh, the Soviet uh, Union. Um, sorry, okay. Hold the mic for the bottom. Is the only answer? The bottom. Yeah. All right. Always on the Archbishop. All right. That's better. Uh, So the Catholic Youth Services work and the work of these dioceses really uh, was made possible by this the, the terrible conflict of event that led to such suffering in Cuba. Um, and, and we, we were, uh, Catholic Youth Services was able to negotiate with the government a role for uh, outside donors to channel massive amounts of assistance through, through, the, through the Catholic Church in Cuba. And this was good for the Cuban people, it was good for the Cuban government, and it was really a new day for the, for the church, who just wanted a seat at the table uh, to discuss and resolve the challenges that uh, the Cuban people face. And from a very small amounts of containers in the beginning, some years there were only three that would go in. Uh, in recent years, more than 20 containers have been, have been uh, channeled through, through Caritas to the Cubans. But I also want to talk about two examples uh, outside of the humanitarian realm that I think were very significant. The humanitarian example did provide uh, an opportunity for the church to build a track record and to build trust with, with the uh, Cuban people and with the Cuban government. And that credibility opened the door for an effort by Caritas Matanzas to establish uh, an agricultural development project in the late 90s that was really unique. The door opened, as so often happens uh, with the package of economic reforms, a package of economic reforms pursued by the government in its efforts to deal with the economic collapse and the end of the Soviet subsidies. The government legalized the possession of dollars, which had been strictly forbidden if you go to jail if you had a dollar for a year. Uh, they also created new agricultural markets outside of the traditional centrally controlled markets and allowed people to use dollars to purchase food. Uh, in those markets. 
and they also allowed cooperative farmers who had access to small parcels of land uh, the uh, ability and the permission to cultivate crops and livestock that they could sell in those markets. And there was a very ingenious uh, director of Caritas named Matanzas who uh, was trying to address the problem that Cuban farmers don't have the capital to build up any production. Uh, so he was able to negotiate with the Association of Small Farmers, which is a state controlled entity uh, with their provincial office and with the local university to provide the materials to the local farmers to be able to start these products, projects. And the money came from private donors in the United States giving the Catholic Relief Services, uh, and we supplied the, the funding to Caritas. Um, the farmers were allowed access to, the, to buy piglets and materials for fencing and water systems and, and pig feed, and they were given technical help by the university. And this was really an amazing, groundbreaking event. CRS was welcomed. I was welcomed. Um, unfortunately, after two years, the project was called to a sudden halt. And it was never exactly clear why that happened. But it was presumed that the Communist Party had, uh, had decided that this model was not something that they wanted to re replicate, even though the local farmers wanted to. And they were even actively speaking to CRS about duplicating it in other places. But the effects of that project were really long-lived, and I was down uh, in Athens two years ago and speaking to some of the same people that we worked with, who were, who were members of the Communist Party or part of that. Uh, and I can't overemphasize how interesting it was and how wonderful it was to see the meeting of minds when we would have our regular monitoring meetings, where you had lifelong communists who may have had memories of growing up in a religious household that didn't have that life anymore. And they could disagree, but there was a great respect between them. And those are the kind of relationships that those projects make a uh, big difference. The mutual trust still endures. Uh, and that's what reconciliation looks like. And that's why those projects are important. And our was talking about reconciliation. These are not small ideas. It's solidarity and it's reconciliation. Um, now, just a few more ways, like another example, but Currently, the, the Cuban government is trying to implement a massive amount of reforms, which I think a lot of people are probably justifiably skeptical about. But the fact is, it will open a window for more cooperation if the church, and I think the church would want it, and is already accepting uh, the, the, the possibility of, of, of working to expand its role. Um, Raul Castro's reforms are trying to move 35% of the state workforce into private. Uh, set for the private sector. That is not going to be easy, and I myself, as probably many of you, have skepticism that, that it can work. But I wouldn't be surprised if if uh, the door is open for more cooperation uh, between between the state and the government. Again, I think the value of it is the kinds of uh, uh, solidarity, opportunities for solidarity uh, that it opens up, and, and ultimately the, the benefits for the human people are clear. Um, uh, the the uh, Archbishop Wesley mentioned uh, the the new uh, opportunity that the church is pursuing to, to start a, a, a university uh, course uh, with a private university in Spain, the University of uh, Murcia, which will um, try and develop the entrepreneurial skills in a population of people that haven't had that. Um, again, we don't know where these reforms are going to go, but. Um, I think that that's a very welcome thing that, I, that I'm sure the church will try and expand. In terms of other aspects of religious freedom, as the Archbishop said, uh, things have improved a lot. They're not where they want to be. But there is no subject which is off limits of church publications, it's and uh, 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 the, other, the other publications. Even political pluralism, pluralism democracy, uh, these things are, are, are discussed. It's not enough, but the people are getting to know the church, they're getting to know the views of the church. It's opening their minds. Um, and again, you see the same strategies, engagement, transparency, persistence, and a willingness to fail and start over if, they, if, if, the, road, if the door is closed. And I really don't see any better option, frankly. It's not perfect, but it's certainly welcome to people. And if you welcome to Cuba, and if you speak to the dissidents or other people in Cuba, uh, or in the United States who follow this closely, they, they generally are, are very supportive. 
that, that there is a, an institution of human society that's willing to respectfully disagree with the dominant ideology, and that's happening more and more. Again, to me, this is, uh, it, this is what strong uh, solidarity looks like. I, just to close, I was asking a couple suggestions as to what the U.S. Congress and the U.S. administration could do. Um, I don't think, I work in Congress now, I don't think there's much hope that anything can come out of the Foreign Affairs Committee that would have much of an impact for the, for the benefit of Cubans, frankly, in, in, uh, in Cuba. Um, and some members of Congress have criticized the Cardinal for the, the comments that uh, Bishop must be referred to. Uh, and I think we can only expect more punitive measures, unfortunately. But on the administration side, I think that uh, what the Archbishop said is exactly right. The, the administration has to take ownership for its programs and for what Radio RT says. And sadly, I think it has been too willing to see the whole Cuba sphere to, to people who um, are, are outside of the development community, frankly. And uh, uh, I, I think that the editorial that appeared in Radio RT was shameful, and there hasn't been an apology for that. And I think I think it's time for, for a review of the policy just because there are many things that are changing there. And, uh, and above all, as the Archbishop also said, I think the philosophy of do no harm should be, should be what they follow. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom. And now we would like to open it up for questions and comments. Yes. I have a question concerning the relationship of the Catholic Church and other religious communities in Cuba, Protestants, but also even Santeria, the small Jewish community. Is the regime still trying to use one community against the other? Are there chances of the religious communities working together for the broader religious freedom of all? Because I think in the process of reconciliation, the relationship between these religious communities uh, should be important. I'm looking for a seal, the way in which the Catholic the Pentecostals and the Afro Brazilian communities, all of them are thriving in interesting dynamic competition, but also uh, uh, dialogue and, and working together. So, to which extent this dynamic of religious pluralism will have the chances uh, in, in Cuba to take place? There has been uh, you know, some level of dialogue between Catholics and other Protestant groups in Haiti. Uh, I think there are friendly relations. There is still in, in, in Cuba you know, a, a bit of suspicion of people that you don't, you don't know well. And uh, as I mentioned, there is a Protestant group in you know, the Protestant uh, Association that's been pretty much a uh, a product of the government, and, and the church has resisted joining that, not for any uh, uh, antagonism towards religious dialogue, but in order to avoid being co-opted or losing its independence. Uh, there has been with Caritas good cooperation with the small Jewish community there. Because oftentimes, because of the small Jewish community, Caritas has been a way of, uh, of, of being a conduit to that community. Uh, that community is also getting smaller because of migration outside of, outside of Cuba. The relationship with the Santeria group is a little bit more complex and complicated. For example, during both of the Pope's visits, uh, Santeria practitioners protested that the church did not reach out to them in the same way that it reached out to uh, Christian uh, denominations to the price of the visit of the Pope and that they could feel part of it. So there is certainly a lot more that can be done there. Uh, in in uh, in South Florida, we, we try to maintain a good dialogue with various human pastors uh, 
and both Catholic priests and the Cuban pastors in the community, and that has been productive. So I think on the other side, it can be also as productive. Any other questions? Yes.
sometimes it's hard to establish communication. So the reconciliation is done through that communication. And so 
everybody knows that you know one day they could be shut down or closed down. Uh, given you know the, uh, the you know the growth of the internet, which is highly restricted in Cuba still, but most of those magazines. These magazines that are available on, on the internet. It's possible to got Black Islands, for example, is one uh, very important one. It's a magazine done by the, the Council of Laity of the Archdiocese of Havana. And you can go online and you access their, uh, their columns. The, the level of discourse in these articles is of the highest category. Um, that, that I sort of had the same question, and that was, you know, how how much is the internet actually uh, controlled, and and is there, and also I suppose, you know, if our ordinary people be able to access the internet because there, perhaps there is lack of the ability to do that. It is difficult for people to access the internet, but when I got my last visit there, I, I, uh, I learned how, how many people are able to access it through friends' work. It's actually a buggy market where you can pay the, the neighbor across the street uh, $10 and then you can have access to their work email. And I think that there's no way that the state can monitor all that, that closely. And I think it's, hard, it's far from perfect, but the, the internet is, is fairly, uh, accessible to, to a lot of humans. And again, it's not what it should be, but um, it is certainly a way where there, there are Cubans and uh, Cuban Americans are sustaining a dialogue about some of these issues through discussions around the publications and other fora um, that, 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 that continues. When I was there for the Pope's visits, one of the pastors was very proud of all the Technical materials that he pirated from the United States, and some of the government has brought to them this, uh, made this for everybody to bear. This is quite a change from a few years ago, where it was almost impossible even to get paper in order to be able to help. That things were so very much controlled compared to they are now. It's everything is, uh, you know, efficient again very precarious. The church goes out and makes this space, but you don't know when the government's going to send it and say, too much, too far, stop. Yes. What about the involvement of the Latin American conference of bishops or other Latin American bishops or churches, which is in the allegations of the other, they're very much engaged in all because the officials of Cuba are members of SANA, and uh, some of them are officers of SANA at different times. And, and of course, uh, Cuba counts with the number of missionary priests from Latin America, especially Mexico and, and Colombia. One of the things I wanted to mention that I forgot was uh, what was an uh, important logo or achievement of the church in Cuba was two years ago when the church was involved in negotiations for the release of political prisoners uh, that uh, uh, that took place between the Cardinal and the President of the Bishop's Conference, uh, Archbishop Dionisio, and the Cuban government. It was significant in the sense that the government welcomed the involvement of the church as an interlocutor with them. So you had actually a you know a tacit admission that the church was a player in civil society in Cuba. In previous years, the church, uh, the, the state would very rarely uh, talk to the bishops of Cuba directly. And if they wanted to talk about the church or to the church, they would do so through the nuncio. 
And the Cuban missions, I remember them telling me in one of my visits, you know, we're Cubans, our government should be talking to us and not to us through another intermediary. So uh, the fact that the church is now talking directly with the government, the government is talking directly with the church, is a significant uh, step forward. And again, you know, from the time when the relations between uh, the state and the church were so icy and hostile, and, uh, and walls were built uh, by both sides against each other, now you have, you know, uh, you know the Pope comes and all the top numbers of the uh, government are there, you know, but they, they're there, and they're there in a respectful presence. Uh, something that uh, 20 years ago would have been, you know, unheard of. Uh, I think when John Paul II came to Cuba and Fidel Castro came to Mass, that was the first time he went to a Mass in the vernacular. Because the last time he had been to Mass and he was a student at Bayland, it was all in Latin. And when he came to that Mass for the Holy Father in 1998, he came dressed in a blue suit and not in his military fatigues as, as was his custom to appear before. So there has been an evolution, a rapprochement. They, they, they try to dig themselves out of a situation and this, the situation has been complicated by so much history and, and, and by, by the ideology which sometimes uh, you know, change peoples and, and clouds their, their thinking in their minds on how to get out or how to move. Uh, and it's remarkable what has happened today. The only thing is, is that we're, we're saying we've got, we're, we hope that everybody has the courage to take the next and necessary steps towards a clear society, both for the church and for all of civil society.
little. Certainly, I think that uh, what Quincy uh, and, and Tom uh, demonstrated is that the church in Cuba is moving from a church of survival to a time of renewal. There are many challenges, many dangers, also many opportunities, and certainly the great interest in trying to promote uh, reconciliation and unity there has for a long time been a lot of tension between the Cubans and the diaspora and the, the church in Cuba and that is not helpful going forward as we look to this uh, hopeful soft landing and, uh, so whatever our church can do to promote a greater unity and understanding uh, is certainly something that needs to be done and hopefully our uh, government will also promote that kind of unity and a peaceful transition as we move forward to uh, the change that are coming up. So once again, I want to thank our speakers, thank all of you, and remind you that in 15 minutes we are supposed to assemble for the courts uh, for all the members representing us there. Thank you very much.